All right, man. So what's your name and where are you from? My name's Frank Rodriguez. I'm uh, located in, in uh, Sunbury, Pennsylvania, originally from New York, and okay. uh, moved out to Pennsylvania when I was younger. That's what's up, man. And uh, you happen to have, we're going to talk about this a little more in the uh, end of the video, but you have a YouTube channel as well, and it's pretty damn entertaining. I actually, man, before I uh, knew the whole channel thing, I've actually seen one of your videos before okay. and didn't even know, and now it's all falling into place. So it's pretty cool, man. But uh, yeah, before we get into that, mm -hmm. how much time have you done in the penitentiary, man? I've done 17 years in the penitentiary. And uh, I've got probably about three or four years juvenile stuff before going to the penitentiary. Yeah, so you, you've done a large portion of your life in there. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What, so what states and uh, what led you to the penitentiary, man? All right. Uh, at 15 years old, I was in, uh, I was in ninth grade and um, starting a new school. My mom, she ain't really had money for clothes. You know, my mom was going through addiction and stuff, single mother. Yeah. So... I got the bright idea to go do a stick up and uh, went and stuck up a, a, a restaurant and um, I was hoping to get money for clothes, you know, for school clothes. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know, but about a week prior to that, there was another stick up that occurred in the area and the lady was shot in the face. So cops were out patrolling a little extra heavy. Oh, damn. And as soon as as soon as we pulled the stick up, I get the money bag. We're coming out the spot and literally run straight into the cops. They were just happy to do a patrol because they know the restaurant's closed, you know. Yeah. And uh, they were doing a patrol, and I literally run straight into the cops, take off. My two co-defendants got caught right at the scene. I got caught about two weeks later. Damn. Uh, so you made you you got away. You ran. Yeah, I got away. I hauled ass. Ah, uh, you got the quick feet out the bunch. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I hauled ass. I got away. Yeah. And uh, ended up they you know you know how that goes. And, yeah, man. Uh, uh, coming back and snatching me up about two weeks later. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Uh, so that's what started it all, huh? Uh, going into juvie and then uh, well, yeah. how'd you uh end up in the penitentiary, man? Well, that's that's what led me to the penitentiary at fifteen. Oh, over I was violations. I was charged as an adult. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, certified as an adult at the age of fifteen. Prior to that, I had aggravated assaults and drug charges as a juvenile you know i spent uh, a lot of time i grew up in a in a foster home system in the juvenile court system uh boot camps then went to secure lockdowns you know for uh selling drugs and uh aggravated assaults was was mainly and drugs was the main thing yeah that led me to uh that type of trouble when i was young you know yeah that you know i never understood how some states work with the whole juvie thing because I know over here in my state, mm -hmm. you know, you you might see a 17-year-old at most in in the main population, but usually it's not until they turn 18, and then they'll yeah. throw them in there with adults. How yeah. did it work for you? 15, they, they charge you as an adult? Uh, yeah. I mean, how did they do it? They So the day they picked me up, they came and raided the house I was at, uh, took me to the, to the police station, did the fingerprints, booked me, and took me straight to the county prison. Uh, from the county prison, they locked me in the hole for about a week and I didn't know, but they had um, a psychiatrist in the bubble. And from my county, the bubble, you can see in, you can see out from the inside, but you can't see in. So there was a psychologist, a psychiatrist in there watching every time they let me out from my hour of wreck and seeing how I'd mingle with the other, with the other people. And uh, after about a week, excuse me? Adults. Yeah, absolutely. They were adults. Okay, okay. And then uh, I was the only juvenile there, you know. Uh -huh. And then after about a week, the psychiatrist recommended, she's like, look, you can let him into population. You know, um, he seems like he's going to be all right, you know. And then they put me in a maximum security unit until I went to court and everything. And that was, you know, that, that was real eye-opening at, at 15 years old, you know. Yeah, damn right, man. And, you know, I don't know how the hell – I mean, did you have a hard time? You you must not have had a hard time if they let you out there because I know, I don't know, maybe it was just your demeanor where you, uh, I don't know what it was, but a 15-year-old coming to block, usually they're going to be joking the hell out of them, riding them, you know, uh, yeah. maybe even extorting them or something like that. I mean, no, it, like, 
it was different. It was different. The place, the, the, the maximum security block that I was on, it was a lot of people that was there from immigration. They came from the feds from doing a whole gang of oh, time okay. or the state. And there was also people on the way to the feds in the state. So a lot of the people, to be honest with you, at first, um, you know, I, I think they felt sorry for me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That they was like, damn, here's this little kid yep. coming into the penitentiary. They seen uh, I was a knucklehead. You know, I had a I had a real bad attitude at the time. And uh, they seen that. And I, I think they was like, damn, this kid is headed nowhere fast. Because I realized that as I got older in the penitentiary and I'd see the young kids come through and I'd look at them, I'd be like, damn, he reminds me of me when I was young. So I think that's what they seen. And um, nobody, for the most part, it, it was it was it was all right. You know, um, I was always being raised in the streets. I was I was always around older dudes. So I was a little more mature for my age than the average 15 year old. Yeah. And at the same time, from having a bad attitude and being a knucklehead, um, you know, everything was go with me. You know, if, yeah. if I felt the slightest disrespect, it was go, you know, so. That's that's basically the way so it you're was. Pretty much trained to go, ready ready to do what you need to do. Uh, yeah, yeah absolutely. most fifteen year olds definitely ain't. They might they might try, but <laughs> yeah, it ain't really happening. Uh, yeah, all right, so you, you you go through. How long were you in that jail before they shipped you to like? Was that considered? Because you say penitentiary, but is that like the legit penitentiary? That was the county prison until I got yeah. sentenced, and then once okay. I got sentenced, that's when I went to the penitentiary. I went to the state prison. Okay, and how old were you when you got there? Uh, I was a little over 16 when I got to the state prison. State prison, uh, I was 16 years old, and that was a whole different ball game. I remember coming on the bus, and it was the summertime, and they had all the yards out at once. So you just see on, on our main, uh, the hub where you first go to to get classified, you know, there's 25, 30 blocks, and there's – you know, a couple hundred inmates on, on each block. And I just remember seeing it looked like a sea as far as I could see of inmates. And I just looked and I was like, what the fuck did I get myself into? That's, that's what my initial thought. Well, that's crazy, man. Uh, I mean, so when you get to this prison, was, I mean, were you running with anyone on the streets or anything like that? Yeah, I did. Um, I was mainly before I went to prison, um, I was mainly, you know, messing around with family. I had I had a decent sized family out here and we was all involved in the streets. Um, but when I got to the penitentiary, that was a whole different ball game because there wasn't really anybody I knew. You know what I mean? Yeah. And being my age, uh, you know, it, it was it was a whole different ball game too. Because yes. the normal kids that I was hanging out with that weren't adults, you know, they were home. So I, I went up there. I was basically by myself for a while. And then, you know how it is, you, you get into prison and you end up meeting somebody and clicking up, you know, and uh, and things like that. And that's that's the way it was for a little while. Yeah. Uh, that's unbelievable, man. They put you on the main line in there? Yeah. Yep. They put me on the main line. Um, we had a block that was for juveniles that were yeah. that were uh certified as adults but you mingle with everybody you know and at the time in pennsylvania there wasn't a lot of state prisons now they have state prisons strictly for juveniles where the majority of juveniles will go where they focus on education and rehabilitation a little bit more than the penitentiaries but yes. they didn't have that at that time so as yeah. soon as i got classified they sent me to a level four prison um dallas it's sci dallas is called and that shit was it was yard out there. It was Dallas is known. They call it the Pink Palace. It's Pink known, Palace. Yeah. So listen, it's known for it's all violent offenders there, and okay. there's a whole bunch of predators there. That's why. Oh God, Palace. that's why it's called the Pink Palace. Yep. <laughs> listen, I remember being on the bus. I was about to say that too, man. That's listen, funny. All right, all right, man. Being on the bus, you know, there's there's always some older guys that it's their third time around. And they're, you know, we, over here, you don't know where you're going until they tell you get off the bus. Yeah. So we made a couple stops and everybody was, the old heads, they was like, yo, I want to go to Dallas because it was wide open. You know, you can do whatever you want. But they're also telling, yo, there's a lot of dudes up there. They, they call them takedown boys here in, in Pennsylvania. Where Takedown you know, boys. I yeah. ain't heard that shit before. 
Yep, that's the dudes that, you know, they're looking for prey. They're looking yeah. for sweet, young looking... guys, and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's what they're looking for. So they're talking about it, and I'm getting nervous. You know, I, I can't even front because I'm getting nervous. Hey, I'm getting nervous you just telling the story. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm getting nervous. That, that was, besides going to the classification prison and seeing all those inmates, that yeah. was the first time that I was like, all right, you know, I done got myself into some shit. The, the first classification, I was like, all right. The only thing I was worried about there was physical altercations and my size because I was small for my age. I didn't come into to my size until I was, you know, in my in my early 20s. I was a small kid at 15, 16 years old. Yeah, but yeah, then when they tell you, was. yeah, when they when you get to that <clears throat> to Dallas and they're telling you, you know, this penitentiary, it's not so much fight and stab and it's they trying to take motherfuckers ass. That was a whole different thing. You know, I was like, damn, I got to worry about that. You know, so <laughs> first thing I did was I said, I got to find myself some steel, you know, and and yeah, just make sure. sure that I'm prepared if that ever comes down to it, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's the first thing I did. I mean, that's like every man's worst nightmare, man, when it comes to paying attention. They might not admit it, but for real, you know, if that shit's happening in that prison. Yeah. And, you know. I mean that's that's like the worst possible case scenario that could happen to you, man. You Absolutely. Know? Forget, forget that, you know. But uh, yep. And especially being a, being a, being a sixteen year old. Yeah, I mean that's like automatic prey. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing you could do if a grown man wants to impose his will on you. There's nothing you could do. Yeah, you know, you might be enough. able to get him on a get back, but in the time when it's when it's you know when it's going on, there's nothing you could do. So you gotta, you know, I, I had to put on super mask and any any sign of disrespect that i seen i had to address it right away just to let them know look i might be young but i'm about to shit you know yeah and um that's the way it was you know well what uh tell me a little bit about the uh whole gang life in there man who what type of gangs run, were running around in pennsylvania i've heard a wide variety yep all right so um a lot of the gangs in the penitentiary didn't start in in pennsylvania it didn't start until like the early 2000s before that it was um of course they, they had muslims the latin kings were there the bloods and the crips weren't too too uh too active in the prison at that time you know from pittsburgh out western pa they had a lot of crips and stuff but in philly that's where a lot of the people come from philly harrisburg those cities they, they wasn't really gang related it was yeah. neighborhoods more neighborhoods yeah i heard yeah. that too and then in the uh, early 2000s that's when everything started switching over and you started seeing an influx of of gangs coming in the prison with the young kids yeah um well was it pennsylvania man i'm trying to remember if it was pennsylvania people were asking me about uh dmi have you ever heard dmi yeah Maybe dead man it, incorporated yeah yeah they're out of Is, baltimore baltimore maryland but okay they, they have them here because we're right there, you know. Yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. I, I couldn't, I just got them twisted up. So they are out there too. Yeah, they are. They're the Black Gorilla family, DMI used to, Black Gorilla family they used to contract out DMI to do their dirty work. So okay. that's where they, you know, they was, they was basically just people, you know, hit boys that they get paid to take care of business and that's what they was doing. Damn. You know? That's crazy as hell. See, I've never even seen or heard of that shit until i started doing this whole yeah uh prison thing man i've been my eyes have been open to so much man it's crazy how different just from one location to another uh the cultures, could be, absolutely. Yeah, there'd be more gangs <laughs> could just be hoods no gangs and some people worrying about their cheeks being taken and other yeah. shit you just don't see it that because it ain't allowed you know so yeah. uh it's crazy man uh well tell me was there any kind of situations where you're, you're you know, you might have, you know? Absolutely. Listen, I remember my first week there <clears throat> in Dallas. It was a big shower room, you know, so uh -huh. everybody, the whole block goes down to the shower at once. So there's, you know, three, four hundred people taking a shower at once. So we had sections where the white guys, the Spanish guys, the black guys, and then there was other people that didn't really fit in. They would take showers in one section, but the Spanish guys... We would, you know, we we would watch each other's back while we go to the shower, you know, make sure everything is all right. Um, but we would go down there 
strapped up. You know what I mean? I go down to the shower. I have my state boots on, uh, my coat on. I have me a piece of steel in my coat. And then when I get down there, that's when I change into my shower shoes and put some shorts on. And while I'm in the shower, I got my homie. He's watching my back while I'm soaping up and rinsing off. And then I'll come out and he'll be in there. And I noticed there was always, you know, you, you, you could tell um, the dudes that, that was even the takedown boys. And I remember there was, there was a, a, a black brother that he was known for that, that that was his thing. And as soon as I came on the block, you know, you pick that stuff up quick. Yeah. And uh, I felt like he was looking at me just a little bit too much, you know? So I said, all right, I got to address this. So as soon as I got out the shower, you got about, we go to the shower at eight o'clock at night. We lock down at nine. So from eight 30 to nine, that's when you, you know, you make your phone calls. If you're doing a little running around on the block, that's what you're doing. And um, I remember I told one of my homies, I said, look, watch the door for me. And I, I slid up in a cell, pulled out on him, you know, and, and told him, I was like, yo, what's up? And, and he was like, no, I wasn't staring at you, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I pulled out on him and told him, I was like, look, this is what it's going to be. I said, I don't know what the fuck you into. I don't care what you into, but it's definitely not flying over here. I said, the next time I catch you looking at me, I'm airing you out, you know, and, and uh, he was like, no, nah, young blood, you know, it's, it's not like that, you know, and I just had to set the precedence. And uh, thankfully, things that time it, it it didn't it didn't call for any violence. But there, you know, there was other stuff down the line in in my uh, stays that that led to violence. Nothing over that, you know what I mean? Over, over yeah, those yeah. type of situations. But I, if and I, I was I was young, so I was insecure. Also, you know what I'm saying? Yes. So maybe maybe dude wasn't even looking at me. But if I felt he was looking at me, I had to address it. And I always felt. Uh, from being raised in the streets, I always felt like I'm not the type of person that's really too good with arguing. If I get nervous or, or feel like it's going to be a situation, I have to go, you know, because I, I was small also. So I was yeah. like, I damn sure can't let, let nobody get the jump on me. So I just got to go. Yeah. And uh, thankfully, it didn't lead to a situation that time, you know. And um, after that, you know, you know how people talk. Other dudes on the block seen what was going on. So they was like, all right, young and, you know, he's, he's about his business. And, um, you know, that that led to to uh, having a little bit of respect and, you know, things like that. And then throughout other situations, you know, I was I was uh, affiliated with the Latin Kings when I was when I was in the penitentiary. Um, so, you know, that that also leads to situations, too, where, you know, sometimes you got to ride out. You don't even know where you're going out to the yard for. You don't know what's going on. You know, you just get the call. Yeah, it was time to go. You know, it's time to go. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> was there any situations that made you run up your time or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Make, make um, you go in the hole for a long period of time, anything like that? Yeah. I spent seven years in the hole. Um, God, damn. I spent, they have, they have, um, my thing was I had, I had a severe problem with authority, any type of male authority. I wasn't with it. Um, so I used to be going to war with the cops with the police and there, the COs, um, all that type of stuff. And then I was extremely active with selling drugs in the penitentiary. <clears throat> so you know how, you know, stuff, yeah. stuff comes with that also. So it would constantly leave me. I, I, uh, got, I'd be getting kicked out of one prison, sent to another prison, kicked out of that prison, sent to another prison. That's what they do in PA. If yeah. you're, they, they call it a, uh, STG security threat group if you're labeled as one of those people then they'll lock you in a hole and you might start with 90 days you know and you're back the hole and you're gang warring with your neighbor and and you might end up you know cursing out the cops spitting on the cops throwing some piss on the cops and you stay back there for six months and that's that's what it ended up being you know i, I got into some stuff with an inmate um got you know like 60 days 90 days and uh ended up staying back there for a while you know just because the cops in in the whole day was they was crazy, you know. In that in that penitentiary, they, this was before they had cameras and all that stuff. So the cops they could do whatever they want, you know. Yeah, you had yeah. to be when they come serve you your child, you got to be in the back of the cell facing the wall. Um, and if they don't like you, they'll skip right past you. And you know those three meals are are you crucial. Yeah, that's you everything. That. Yeah, yeah that's you everything. Need that. They would do that with with mail too. There's plenty of times they come to the cell and and. My mouth with just being so young and being so out of control, I was loose with my mouth and and uh, 
you know, the cops say something I don't like and I'm I'm going at it with them. And, you know, there's times they come to be like Rodriguez mail and come I go to get my mail and they rip it up right in your face, you know, and uh that just leads to, to some other shit. Now the next time the cop passes, I want to throw some piss on them or, or spit yeah. on them or whatever. Damn you know? right, man. And and that's what it led to. And they're spending seven years in the hole. I was in a it's called the SMU special management unit where you literally have to earn your rights. You're in there. It's an 18 month program. You start at level four and you work your way down and you have to earn newspapers. You have to earn writing literature. You know, they give you nothing at first, nothing. You can't get no mail. You can't get no letters. You can't get no books, nothing but legal work. And then uh, after you earn your levels, then you can earn, you know, where you start getting mail and stuff like that. But through the whole process of that, you know, you're, you're gang warm with somebody across the tier or, you know, or you might have a homie back there where a homie's trying to send you a book over on a, on a string and uh, you get caught by the cops and now they knock your level back. So there's plenty of times that happened where they give you a setback and I'm like, well, fuck it. I, what I got to lose? I don't have nothing in my cell anyway, you know, and, uh, and start gang warring with the cops. You know. What you mean by uh, when you say gang warn, you're just saying pretty much talking shit, probably back and forth talking or shit, what? I'm throwing piss on them, whatever. You know what I mean? Whatever. So, so y'all both, so you ever, you, you've had rivals or something, yeah. really, like just y'all throwing piss back and forth at each other. Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy as hell, yeah, man. Mainly with the cops <laughs> because you know yeah. when that stuff is going on. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. They, but I, I've also seen where dudes, you know, we get strip searched before we yes. go to the yard, and it's in a kennel. You go in like a dog kennel. So dudes will hide, you know, uh, keep the milk carton from lunch yep. and fill it up with piss and shit oh. and go to throw it on somebody, you know. So uh, that that's the type of shit that happens in those things because yeah. that's the only way you can get to each other. That's you know, all, yeah, you that's, physically that's, can't touch each other. So shit, that's that's worse than physical, to tell you the truth. Sometimes, you yeah. know, well, most of the time, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, that's why I didn't go out to the kennel sometimes, man, because there yeah. was a known uh, milk carton thrower, I guess you could call him. Yep. And I wasn't risking that shit, so I just went to showers and went right back to my cell, man. Yeah, we uh, call it chemical warfare over here. Chemical warfare it is, and, man. Listen, and they had radiators in your cell, so you would let that shit cook on oh, the radiator. Oh, fermate, nice and warm, huh? For a week, you know what I mean? Oh. Yep, and you could smell it cooking. You know, you smell somebody <laughs> cooking up a stew. Yeah. Yep. It, it was a crazy. A stew, man. Y'all call it yep. a stew. Yeah. It, God it, Listen, dang. and then when somebody would throw it, that shit would literally... Nobody in the in the whole tier could you couldn't smell it. You know what I mean? It was so overpowering and so strong. It it was it was nasty. It it reminded me like some real animalistic shit. That shit that like oh, primates yeah. do. You know what I mean? Throwing shit at each other. And yeah. It was it was crazy. You know it was crazy. Yeah, that, that's nuts, man. Uh, well, shit was and you said that prison y'all go by level by levels, correct? Yeah, level five is capital cases. That's yeah. that's or when you're in the the whole or the SMU. That's level yeah. five. Level four is that's your highest security. You know you got to have extremely violent crimes or a violent jacket inside the prison to get level four, level three, and level two. Two's the lowest. Okay. You know that's the way it goes in in a state system in PA. Okay. Uh. And I mean, so what was probably one of the worst prisons that you were in what was it one you were just speaking on dallas and and greaterford also uh greaterford is is a real big prison it's 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 in the process of getting shut down now it's right outside of philly and uh that prison it was yard out there was you know there there's people being killed there uh there was a dude that that damn near got his head cut off in the hallway you know what i mean in the hallway going to going to commissary um literally got his his head you know decapitated yeah, and, and that type of shit went down on a normal there because there was so much drugs there there was so much corruption so you know wherever there's drugs and corruption there's violence you know yeah. that's that's a given they go hand in hand and yeah. that that was you know that was normal to see guards getting stabbed guards getting cut dudes getting stabbed um you know bad and like in pa we have we have the sinks where you can pull the knob out. You have to push oh, it the in. long. They got the long yeah. ass. I know about rod. that jank too, yo. Yeah, they're like that big. Yeah. So somebody get hit with one of them, you're in trouble. Yeah, you know, that's a, a big ass steel. ice pick. 
<laughs> Absolutely it is. So and that's what everybody used to carry. You know, you could carry push rods. And um Them things scare me more than anything for some reason, man. For I don't know why. I've seen some big thick ones. Yeah. But that no. damn ice pick scared the shit out of me, man. For Listen. some reason I always I always had a thought that someone would get me right up in there, you know, like, then you're done, dude, you know? Absolutely. Listen, I remember the first time that I had one for myself, when I realized, I was like, damn, this is a whole, because, of course, you know, I would have razors and all that type of stuff and tuna cans that you, you use and, you know, pieces of metal sharpened up. But when you grab that push rod, it's a whole different ball because, you know, you hit somebody with that, that thing's going through. It's going stopping. It through. don't stop until it hits bone. You know what I mean? And it was it thinking about that now, like the way your mindset has to be to to be ready to go at somebody with that. It, it was a whole different ball game, you know. It, and it it's that's where a lot of people that come home from prison where they still have stuff to deal with. You know what I mean? Yeah. The mental yeah. impact and the emotional yeah. impact, you know, is but but it's it's a way of life in there. You know, unfortunately, it's a way of life. And uh, at a young age, that shit. Listen, it took me, I'm 39 years old now, and there's stuff that that I've done to people or, or seen done to people that I'm just starting to get over, you know, that that, that stuff stays with you. You know, yeah, I've had yeah. times where I'd have dreams and flashbacks where I'm in the cell tussling with somebody and I feel like I'm fighting for my life and I'll be in the bed with my wife and i am got my hands around her throat and I'm sleeping, you know what I mean? Or punch her in the face and I'm sleeping. And uh, it got to the point I couldn't even have my son sleep in the same bed with me. You know, God, damn, he was a dude. baby. I couldn't have him sleep in the same bed because of having flashbacks and night terrors or that that type of stuff. You know, how you know, I've only done I've done two prison bids, man. Uh, and you know, my longest stretch was about four years. You know, a mm-hmm. little over uh, eight years altogether in and out the prison system. But yeah. uh, you know, I interview you. You're you've done seventeen. I've interviewed guys like. Uh, Someone I just did the other day. He did 38 years straight, and I'm like, I was just listening to that today. You know, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, I still got a little bit every now and then that you know, uh, I can only imagine what guys like you and dude yeah. other other guys I've interviewed can come out here, and I don't think people understand how mentally strong you have to be to see all of that shit and mm-hmm. come out here and make a living and take care of your kids and family man it is amazing and people don't truly understand yeah. that shit you know what i mean yeah exactly uh, the only people that's gonna understand it is somebody that went through it you know what exactly, i'm saying man like you, you can know? you can describe it but and that's why now people be like yo you're so peaceful you're so kind you're so patient and respectful and i say absolutely because i wasn't like this all the time so now the last thing I want is some drama because I know where the potential I have to take it and I, I don't want that. That's the farthest thing from what I want. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a soldier coming back from the, from Afghanistan or Iraq or something. The last thing they want is some type of violence or drama. Yeah, man, because you know? they want f- as far away from it as possible. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, look, man, I definitely want to hear more about the prison out there, uh, prison <laughs> system out there in Pennsylvania, so maybe we do part two, but I do want to talk about before Absolutely. we leave – the positive stuff you got going on, man. You're, yeah, you're a barber. You got a you, uh, successful little YouTube channel going. Yeah. Tell me about what's going on in your life right now, man. All right. So I'll, I'll give you a little rundown real quick. What got me going into where I'm at? Uh, I'm in recovery. I was I was a heroin addict for a little while. My mom was killed in 2004, and I had to identify her body, so I couldn't sleep. So a doctor gave me some pills. The pills led to heroin. Uh, December, excuse me, uh, April 24th of 2016, I have a bad weekend and I relapse, sniff a bag of heroin, end up overdosing. My son Damn. basically saved my life. He was two years old at the time. He woke my wife up at one o'clock in the morning. He was like, where's daddy at? My wife come find me in the bathroom, basically dead. Uh, go to ICU. I get out of the hospital three days later and it's like light switch went off in my head. I was like, man, I'm selling myself short. And when I got out of the hospital, the first thing my son said to me, he was like, dad, you died. Cause that's what he heard the ambulance saying and, and my family, you know? So a light switch went off in my head and I was like, all right, I got to make some changes in my life. So, uh, I opened up my barber shop. Um, and then I started doing stuff in my community. I started doing haircuts, uh, one time for Christmas for single mothers that might've been struggling and, you know, things are hard around Christmas. So I opened up the shop, did it for free for 
single mothers threw a little Christmas party for them and the kids. And then the joy and satisfaction I got from that um, was, I can't describe it. So I said, all right, I want to keep on doing this. So uh, I ended up closing my shop down another time and just did free haircuts and food. We did over 200 haircuts, uh, fed over 200 people in the community and did everything for free for the day. Just It was just a way of giving back. I, I always told myself, I was like, I helped to tear so many communities down. I want to help to build them back up. So I started doing that. And then um, I, I started something called Morals Over Money, where for me, I always, you know, uh, my addiction to money lay, was just as powerful as my addiction yeah. to drugs. So I, I compromised my morals and my values to get to get that money. So um, I started once I formed the, the 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 group Morals Over Money. I would get uh, people that were like minded like me, and we'd go and and do stuff uh, positive in the community. You know, every Christmas we have a, a Christmas party for the community where we feed everybody, give out toys to the kids. Uh, we went to Puerto Rico right after the hurricane Maria, spent the week out there doing um, volunteer work. We did haircuts, we did help clean up, we served um, food at distribution centers. Um, and also I, I go down to Kensington, Kensington area in Philadelphia is it's considered the, the the largest open air heroin market in the United States. Yeah, I was, I was about to say that place is uh, pumping it's crazy. out there. Yeah. yeah. So we go down there, we feed, we clothe, and uh, we give hygiene products to the people that's down there homeless, the drug addicts, um, people suffering from mental illness. And then after we did that for a little while, um, I started to realize where those people were, were being looked at like part of the landscape. You know what I mean? People would yeah. walk past them and they'd be an eyesore and be like, ah, they'd be walking with their kids and grab their kids and pull their kids to the side. And I started wanting to humanize them. So I said, let me, let me see if I could get a couple of them to speak and tell their stories. And they started telling their stories. And uh, the response was, was dope. There were so many people that reached out to me and said, you interviewed my mother. You know, you interviewed my son. That's the first time I Damn. seen my son in four years. I didn't even know if he was alive. Wow. There's people that, that said, you know, you interviewed my mother. Thank you. Now I know how to deal with her because of your interview. There's been times where I have the, you know, I'll be walking through Kensington area doing my interviews and stuff. And uh, the cops even pull me over and be like, yo, thank you. You changed the way I deal with them, you know, and um, and it's dope. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to have for me to have the cops change the way they interact with somebody. That's big because I, I was, you know, my whole life uh, being in the streets, I, I grew to hate the police, hate any type of law enforcement until I got a little older and realized, you know, cops, they're just doing their job. Um, if I don't do no crime, I don't have to worry about the cops arresting, you know? And uh, for me, that, that was gratifying. And now, um, the channel's growing, is doing well. There's people we've been able to get into treatment. Uh, just last night, I was in Philly over the weekend, and we dropped the brother off at treatment three o'clock in the morning last night. And um, you know, he he was like, "Look, I'm ready to go. I just I just need to make this change." And uh, and it's beautiful. It's gratifying for me. It helps keep things green for me and remind me what I stand to lose. And there's other people that see um, that see I was down there with them. You know that that I was getting high with them and they, they see, damn, all right, if Frank could do it, maybe I could do it, you know, damn and, right. and it's beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful thing to do. You know, it's, it's extremely gratifying and, um, and it, and it's beautiful to humanize them and let people know, cause there's a lot of negative stigma with addiction and people automatically assume, be like, oh, they do it to themselves. You know, they're just junkies. They're just addicts. They're just homeless people. And once they tell their stories, you'd be like, damn, I can relate to that a lot, you know? And, and realize that, you know, it could be me, it could be my kids, it could be my mother, you know, and it, it, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's helped me to grow in myself and uh, it's a beautiful thing. I, I enjoy it. Yeah, damn right, man. And you know, uh, what I like about it is, you know, same thing that I do over here. I interview, you know, people that's been in the pen, but you know, yeah. both groups somewhat, people look at in a different kind of way you know and uh this is just showing people that you know you ain't got to live in your own world 
Cause you know that was my problem when I when I before I went to prison I was my I was my king this was my world I am me I run everything I'm head honcho yes sir I got a gun I can do what I want yes and sir and then I go to prison and I'm like shit this you know you, you're you're you you cannot have your own world no more you realize yeah, this shit not. is not nowhere near. About yeah. you because you're living around. You get to see everybody for who they are. You're yeah. living with them. You hear their story. You see how they function, their cultures, their their beliefs. And then you're like, shit. You know what? This ain't just one big uh, world that I'm. You know that I'm here running shit. Everybody has a story, man, and it's amazing. Absolutely. You know, and that's what we're hearing. We're hearing stories from people that most people won't even ask. You know. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Exactly, amazing, and, and the thing is, is people are fascinated with it too, though. Fascinated, you know what I mean? They, it's they amazing stories, amazing yeah, stories, exactly. and and they realize, you know, they're not too too different than me. It's just a couple bad decisions. I'm away from either being in the penitentiary or being strung out and homeless. You know, Damn right? And and people start realizing that, and and I think it's beautiful to change that stigma, to change the way somebody thinks about somebody else. Is I think that's one of the most powerful things we could do as as human beings you know it is man and you know just to tag on to that uh i do videos on people and sometimes man people will just annihilate them in the comment section yeah. right uh and then i'll do another one and then the third one and by the third time i'll see all the people's whole comments change up like man i judge too soon like damn this is a good guy what was you know and yeah. i see it all the time and that's how it goes man uh yeah. but it is what it is uh there, there was something I want to ask you about there. I think it's in Philly, man. I'm not uh, sure. I don't know if you've heard of this or not, but they got like this place where people can actually go into and do their drugs. Is that Philly? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Philly, they're they're called safe injection sites. Yeah, that's what they're called. Yeah. All right. So Philly, they were gonna put the actual safe injection sites up, and they were getting a lot of backlash from the community. Yeah. I don't know why because. You walk down Kensington, if you watch some of the videos, you'll see just walking down a block, you're going to see people shooting up their neck. You see people smoking crack out in the open in front of the cops. The cops don't say nothing. So they were getting a lot of backlash. So what they did is instead they started putting up mobile bathrooms and you got five minutes in the bathroom. You know what I mean? And they have needle injection boxes, you know, where you used to drop your needle in the box. And that's the way they get around that without having the actual safe injection sites. Yeah. You know, all the bathrooms down there in, in, in Kensington, uh, you go to McDonald's, you go to Burger King, they have needle boxes in all the bathrooms. Holy shit. I think I've seen that, too, and I was a little shocked by it because uh, I was in Philly not too long ago. Um, and, you know, people might think that that's absurd and that's, and I can see how they can look at it in a bad way. Yeah, yeah. It's, but at the same time, you know, that's helping stop spread infections, diseases, yes. and all kinds of shit. Because if they can't get their hands on a, you know, a free, clean needle, yep. uh, then they're going to go resort to getting a dirty one and spreading yeah. whatever, whatever. And it's a chain. And I don't think people really truly understand that mm -hmm. how much of a daisy chain reaction it is when people start, sh you know, viruses yeah. start spreading. That shit will ruin a whole community. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, There's uh, been a huge outbreak of uh, hepatitis A down Hepatitis, yeah. Because, you know, there you walk down a block and you see human shit all over the place. Yeah. You know, um, it, it's crazy. When I do some, a lot of times I'll do live walkthroughs on my channel and people will be like, I never knew this shit existed in America. You know, yeah. where there'd be people from different countries will be like, yo, why is it so dirty? It's, are, is that guy dead on the floor, you know, and you see people stretched out all over the place. See people shooting up in their neck. It's, it's common sight, you know, right in front of the cops and the cops don't do nothing. You know, they, yeah. as long as there's no violence, the cops don't get involved. Yeah, it's probably is so much that if they were to do something, there would be no room in them jails for anybody. Exactly. And, and that's what I like when now, when I, when I speak to the cops down there, cause a lot of them will stop me and, and talk to me and I ask them, I'll be like, damn, I know y'all got a hard job down here because <laughs> not only, do you have drugs on every single corner? There's people selling drugs on every single corner. You have to deal with all the drug addicts that come with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's it's you're you're walking down a block and you're stepping over dozens of dirty needles on the floor. You know, it's crazy, man. It's it's like nothing you've ever seen. You know, like nothing you've ever seen. It's unbelievable, man. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, I enjoyed this interview, and I think this is going to shed a lot of light to people that don't know too much about this state. And uh, we didn't talk uh, uh, too much. I wanted to hear both sides, a little bit of the streets and prison. Yeah. So uh, maybe if you want, you know, we could do a part two and Absolutely, talk a little brother. more about prison because I do have a lot yeah. more questions to ask. But uh, yeah. if you don't mind, go ahead and shout out whatever you got going on, on social media, and then send me the links at the end, and I'll make sure it's pinned in the description. And in the comment section for my audience to check out, if y'all want to check it out. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Tell me what you got going on. What's the names of these? All right. Uh, the channel is called ATG Vlogs. Uh, my Instagram is at King Frank underscore. Um, and, I, brother, I want to thank you. I want to thank, thank you for um, allowing me on your platform. And I also want to thank you for what you're doing because, you know, there there's just just like we just spoke about uh with the stigma of incarcerated people you know yeah. it it's hard and it's changing little by little but it's it still, is it's still got a long way to go you yeah. know it's still got a long way to go we you know there's some of us that you know there's people that that i've met along my journeys that that's why prisons are built because they're evil motherfuckers and then there's other people that make some mistakes you yeah. know so i i thank you brother um i i ask y'all to check out the page ATG Vlogs, again, the series is called Faces of Kensington, and you'll see people's stories there, and uh, Instagram is at King Frank. I appreciate each and everybody listening, and, and I thank you, brother. I, I and, thank you very much. And likewise, man, I thank you for coming on tell your story, and uh, go check it out, ladies and gentlemen. I subscribe to the channel. I mean, the stories can be crazy at times, you know? Uh, yeah. But yeah, man, just keep doing what you're doing. Just exceeding in life and, uh, Absolutely. you know, get, no getting higher. No point stop, brother. No, no point stopping, man. Just keep it going, man. And you're on the right track just like I am, you know? We're, yes, sir. We're feeding off each other's energy and we're going to make it happen. You know what I mean? Uh, Absolutely. But yeah, but yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I'll leave all of his information pinned in the description in the comment section, man. And I salute to you for coming on to the Thank show. Thank you, brother. Likewise, man. I appreciate you. Have a blessed night. And, uh, I thank you once again, brother, and I'll shoot hey, you that man. information on Instagram, all right? All right, thank you, man. You have a good rest of your night as well. Thank you, brother.